Bandwidth for this podcast is brought to you by ID8 Software. Be sure to check out all of their great Revit applications designed to increase your productivity. Welcome to BIM Thoughts. You've made another episode. We've made another episode. You're listening to another episode, and all the episodes are great, so you should just keep on listening. I'm not going to do the singing again because Carl had a fit. So there you have it. So we are joined by Carl Storms, Dana DeFilippi, and Karen Robichaud. Hello. Hello. Karen, define yourself. That's a tough one. No, it's not. You should know. You, you know yourself best. <laughs> uh, so I'm a communications director. I work for Bull and Swinsky Jackson, which is an architecture firm. You may have heard of it. Um, and I came about to architecture kind of through a meandering path. My background is in literature and theater. So I really think of myself as a storyteller. I've always loved narrative. I challenged myself to read 100 books in a year two years ago. I didn't do wow. it. I got to like 85. What um, I have a full-time job. You it's have really hard. <laughs> a lot of people told me to do that. Um, <laughs> but since reading has always been my de-stressor and pleasure uh -huh. activity, I refuse to compromise on my choices. Hmm. I learned something interesting about reading. What's that? And um, – I heard this on a podcast, so it's got to be true. Um, some people read to themselves, and they actually read to themselves in their mind. They hear them their their mind's voice mm -hmm. as they read, and other people just read and they don't hear their mind's voice, and they just haul ass through the book. Mm -hmm. Are you a haul asser, or are you a mind uh, reading it in your in your head? I think it kind of depends. There are books uh -huh. that are so plot driven that you're really just racing through it because you want to know yeah. who done it or what the unreliable narrator really means or whatever it is. Uh -huh. But there are definitely books where the language is what you're meant to luxuriate in. And there uh -huh. are certainly times when I can hear my own voice in my head. And there uh -huh. are things that I will read kind of in a whisper out loud to myself if I'm having trouble latching into them like sometimes when i'm starting a new book or coming back to a book after a while i need that thing to anchor me in so if you're concentrating then you're listening to yourself but if you're enjoying you're just moving along and going with the flow yeah i mean yeah, I, I also listen to a lot of audiobooks uh-huh um and it's really interesting to see what different narrators do and which ones you click into faster and yeah. why and is it because of the story is it because of the writing is it because of that performance on the audiobooks do you consider listening to an audiobook saying i read this book or do you oh yeah yeah okay. yeah i count that in my as as you're reading total the for the year yeah, yeah, yeah okay all right you're still okay. digesting the information i guess so. you know knowing the story learning whatever it is yeah I guess just by listening, you're still like building your vocabulary, right? Like yeah, you're, it's, you know, it's, it's a little different. Maybe you're not getting the information on how it's spelled, but who cares about that nowadays anyway, <laughs> right? Well, you're still spending that time in that story. Well, and it looks like you describe yourself as a storyteller also. Yeah. I mean, I, I, um, I worked in nonprofit arts before I found my way to architecture and I really fell into working with architects I was um, at Boston Lyric Opera for a few years. And when I got burned out there, I was looking around for a new job. And I happened to apply to an architecture firm as one of many graphic designer communications type jobs. And, you know, it worked out. I got hired at Payette, which was the firm I was with for seven years. Um, and I, I really grew into the role I had there. I started out as a graphic designer supporting the marketing department. And when I left, I was the director of creative engagement, which was all sorts of things. Wow. So I I had the luxury, I'm going to say luxury, of seeing you at a conference called KA Connect, mm -hmm. which is Knowledge Architecture's conference they have every year. And most of our listeners being architects, they probably are using Synthesis, but they don't know that they're using it as their back end for their intranet. Yeah. 
but your talk was all about marketing the firm and marketing yourself in the firm is what I got out of it. And I thought that marketing yourself in the firm, especially today, is probably one of the most important things you can do to make sure that the firm knows who you are and what you do and what you know. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's particularly important for emerging talent as they're finding their voice and finding their place in really firms of any scale because there's so much adaptability in a firm because they're all changing all the time. I mean, we're recording this and it's the middle of the COVID-19 outbreak yeah. and we're all sheltered in place at home. Hopefully the middle, right? <laughs> uh, well, it's week three in the Bay Area, so. Yeah, it's week three here in Las Vegas. Um, you know, what I think about is how do firms adapt to their current circumstances, whether that be what we're talking about right now, a global pandemic, or even just what's important to our clients and what uh, types of clients want our work. Um, firms are always adapting the ways they work and think and leverage technology and different types of talent. So even though the firm might hold true its values and ethos from 50 years ago, it still looks and operates differently now. And so the more that emerging talent can figure out like, hey, here's a hole I'm filling, or we could move in this direction. And here's my idea and energy towards getting it done. Um, I think those opportunities to advocate for yourself and carve out real space is where you really figure out, do you have what it takes? Like everyone wants to be an ideas person, but if you really understand how to execute and leverage resources to bring those ideas to fruition, that's the that's who rises to the top. And the more we can make that open and inclusive to everyone, um, that's part of how we get to more diverse leaders in the future so that um, we're not just filling the same mold, but really seeing these other voices and perspectives who can push us forward. So for me, it wasn't just rooted in, hey, here's how I did it, but here's how you could do it, and here's how it can make our firms better. Uh, how do you recommend people get started in doing that? <laughs> do they try to go out on a limb and, t and try to answer a question? Do they come up with new things and say, hey, look at this, what I've discovered? What, what's, uh, how, how do we get started? Well, I think it's so variable because so much of it is um, individual. Like what makes sense for your skill set, your personality, what kind of leader you want to be? Uh, you know, even if it's early in your career, I think so much is like being the sponge and understanding what's the context you're in. And sometimes it's finding out I'm not in a context that's a good fit for what I want to do. Um, and that can be really disheartening and difficult to realize, but that's important information because then you're empowered to say, I need to be in a place that values the same things I do. And I need to go figure out how to do that. Um, so it's not always about making a big move right off the bat. Um, what I've always talked about when I talk about my experience at Payette is that it really started so small. I was, you know, the low woman on the totem pole when I started. I was an entry level employee, really just supporting the marketing department, doing layouts and producing web content. But I used that as a way to talk to more people, to learn more about what was going on in the firm and to poke at things and say, that seems like an interesting idea. I don't know anything about that. Um, could you explain it this way? Or do you think we could do that as a sketch series? Um, and being willing to try in those lower risk settings and get feedback and recalibrate and um, do my homework. I mean, some of it is like, yeah, it's great to have an idea, but if you've done a little bit of research to say, hey, that's viable, or here's the benchmark, here's what other firms have done, here's how I think we could push ourselves beyond that. Um, so I think it's it's part like figuring out what's your mode of operating and what works for you and getting feedback and uh, then trying, especially when you have those lower stakes situations. Like if you're on a team and there is an open charrette, like push yourself and um, test advocating for your idea. I think the other thing that we sometimes forget is that we even need to practice how we express our ideas um, so that other people hear them and can consider them because sometimes things get dismissed when people just don't understand and they feel like they don't have time. Dana, Carl, you have a question? So out of the almost hundred books you read, which one was your favorite? 
Oh, so I actually have been keeping track for the last 10 years. And in 10 years, I've read like 600 books. Wow. That, I mean, I'd say that's a feat. You know, you may not have met the, met the full 100, but 600 books is, is quite a bit. Um, so I have a couple. Um, so one I've been thinking about a lot right now. I don't know that I would recommend reading it right now, but World War Z. Um, it's not like the movie. In, okay, I was about to say that. It is good. not like the movie. No, no, don't do not <laughs> look to that. Actually, I really enjoy reading that type of, of genre. Um, but what's so interesting about that book is that it's the zombie war outbreak is written as if it's a global pandemic. And so the fact that they're zombies is just how it manifests. It's not really about zombies eating your brains. And each chapter is from a different perspective. So the book is uh, the framing device is if a journalist is going through and talking to the doctor who treated patient zero or a dictator in another country or the former US president or a wealthy person who fled to their island retreat or a middle class family who fled to Canada. Um, he's talking to all of these perspectives and that's what the book is. And so this is one that I listened to the audio because in the audio, a different actor performs each chapter. And so it's a very oh, rich really cool. experience. So that's one I've been thinking about a lot because of what's going on right now. So I, you know, just know your own mind if you can handle that right now. Um, another one that I absolutely loved um, that's very short and I think would be um, something good to read right now would be Rainbow Rowell's book, Eleanor and Park. It's about um, two teenagers who fall in love on the school bus in the 80s and their common ground is music. Um, and it's a little bit melancholy and um, it may not seem like it's for everybody, but it's it's just a lovely story of two people and it's not very long and it's an easy read and the chapters alternate. Um, and I've recommended it to a lot of people and I've never had someone come back and say they don't like it. I like that those two books seem incredibly different. Do you like to, to vary be between genres when you read? Yeah, I think, you know, I mostly gravitate towards fiction and I mostly gravitate towards more contemporary fiction. But beyond that, I'm generally genre agnostic, although I'm not a huge sci-fi fantasy fan. Um, but almost anything else, I will give it a go or consider it. I follow a lot of critics and writers on social media. And so that's actually how I get a lot of recommendations is if a writer I really like is... Um, giving a positive review of a new book, I'll usually check it out. It looks like you're also a theater geek. What what draws yeah. you to theater? Well, I got involved in the performing arts when I was really young. And um, I think that and the fact that I've always loved to read is really where I see the value of narrative. And um, I just remember going to performances when I was a kid and watching the actors on stage and thinking, I want to be there. And so I, um, when I was really young, I did children's community theater. I'm sure those productions were excellent. Um, and then in college, I was a stage manager. So I learned how to make the whole thing run. So now, I mean, I go see live performances whenever I can. What uh, social media platform do you recommend we all jump on and try to <laughs> to uh, promote ourselves. Oh gosh, it's so hard to prescribe that because so much of it is about what kind of conversation you want to have. If you want to have a conversation, um, you know, Instagram is great if you have beautiful images you want to share. Um, uh -huh. I think right now we're in a particular moment where there's so much time for reflection and stewing in our own anxieties that um, figuring out how we want to share or not share that, um, and build connection. And, um, I've, I really like Twitter. I found that to be, I guess helpful isn't the right word, but I found it to be interesting. Um, and, you know, particularly right now, it's where you get a lot of perspective on what's going on across the country and the world, um, and how to gauge what feels accurate or how to know how to behave right now. Um, and I like Twitter because it's a place to have conversation. Um, and I, I like that it has this kind of somewhat asynchronous timeline where you can kind of dip into different things. 
Um, but I don't know where it will all shift. I think, um, you know, right now everyone's posting a lot of photos of their baked goods at home and mm-hmm. all the things they're doing to pass the time. So I, I think yeah, it'd be really interesting. Yeah, they're new coworkers. Yeah, to see <laughs> um, what becomes more prominent, especially uh-huh. as more and more people are making like videos at home and that kind of thing. One to stave off boredom, but as another way to feel connected and to see other humans right. when we can't be together. Well, and I, I Googled that talk that uh, Bill was saying that he saw you at. Mm-hmm. And it says here that your team has orchestrated cultural transformation through knowledge man- management approaches. Um, yeah. And I think that's something that we really have t- discussed a lot. We had an episode on um, working remotely, and that was something that we discussed quite a bit um, in terms of how we share the information, how you know this has really transformed the way we worked. It seems like you have really had experience in this in quite some time. Yeah, and I think you know because of the unique moment we're in, we're seeing more and more opportunity to think creatively about how we, one, build culture or maintain culture when we can't rely on serendipitous connection in the office, and two, how we make sure we're still sharing that knowledge. Um, Because again, you're not just walking by someone's computer and saying like, oh, that's interesting. Um, The firm I work for now has six offices. And so that was already part of our question of how do we make sure we're knitting all those offices together and we still feel like one cohesive firm and are sharing information, but you still want to maintain the specialness of each office. (laughs) We all want to make sure we keep that specialness. We all want to have the specialness. (laughs) Right. Well, each each office has a different culture and a different way that they, they approach things. And it's, and it's, it could be the location there that they're at. It could, it could be the studio directors, how they design and or how they uh, talk or how they uh, they hold themselves in there. Um, that that all changes the way that that office behaves. And there's an intimacy to the scale of the offices mm-hmm. that doesn't always exist at a whole firm level. Um, Each of our offices is more in the like 20, 40, 50 person range. So you kind of Mm -hmm. feel like you know everyone or you have some buddies at that scale. And um, while it's very important to all come together and, you know, what that balance is for us is something we're always testing. um, You can have conversations in a different way when it's fewer people. Mm Mm-hmm. I was just going to say that it's definitely right about the scale. I've I've worked at firms where a uh, 400-person firm with four or five different offices, and you've got you know 200 people in an office, and the culture is definitely much different than uh, my my last job where there was six of us in the office. Um, so it certainly makes a difference. But even in that large firm, from one demographic to another, you have you have differences, and, and size makes a difference, but also locations. A a Vancouver office. Canadian here versus a Calgary office, very, very different um, culture as far as, you know, just the way people sort of live their lives and and, and do things. So I, I think that definitely makes a difference. But one of the other things that comes into play is me being the the, the silent type that waits to the end to ask my questions as I as I have some, <laughs> some important ones here for you, Karen. Um, the first one about all, all of the books, and I wholeheartedly <laughs> agree with the idea that if you listen to it, it's uh, it counts. Um, I am a dreadfully slow reader. Uh, I think it's mm-hmm. like what Bill said. As I read, I, I have to read every single word, every it, every the, every practice the makes process. perfect, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> well, and may, maybe that's it. Maybe because I'm listening instead of reading, that's how it goes down. Um, but my question was going to be: Do you have you had any luck with audiobooks for technical content? No. I um, <laughs> I actually purposefully choose audiobooks that I don't care if I miss something. Um, oh, or are like purely propulsive. Um, so there are like I tried to listen to The Power Broker because it's such a long book that I was like I can't be carting this thing around, um, and I couldn't I couldn't get into it. Like I wasn't paying attention, and I was listening to it on a flight. Like what else was I going to be doing? Um, and it's a it's actually an audio book performer who I listened to the Enron book. Um, not the smartest guys in the room. 
That's us. One. No, it's the other <laughs> one. Um, but it, I really like that narrator. And the Enron book is really long and I got super into it, but it's written very narratively where however the power broker was written, like I couldn't hook into it. Um, anyway, I never choose nonfiction or um, technical stuff because if when I'm listening to an audiobook, it's usually I'm walking to work or cooking or doing something with my hands. So it's just like this thing to entertain me. Um, but if I look away or get distracted, I don't want it to be like, okay, now I have no idea what's going on. Okay. That, that makes sense. I, that's <laughs> that kind of how I got into to listening to podcasts, uh, you know, mm -hmm. half hour to kill on the way to work back in the days when we went to work. And uh, <laughs> it, it was always a way to sort of engage. Uh, and from there, it came to be when I would take long visits, you know, or drive to visit the, the in-laws. For me, it made me think. So if I'm thinking, I'm paying attention. Whereas if I have the latest Bon Jovi playing in the background, I'm, I'm not really paying attention. So I needed something to, to engage my brain to think. So for me, listening to the technical stuff, made me think about it and therefore I was engaged in it and therefore I paid attention. Um, plus I, I could never read a thick book. So I need to have somebody read it to me uh, mm -hmm. to pay attention. Um, so I'm kind of on the opposite side of the fence there. The latest Bon Jovi. I, I, I couldn't think of a good thing. Maybe, maybe <laughs> poison rat, quiet riot, some, some nice, some nice 80 glam is really. Well, wonderful. it's not that Bon Jovi is a bad choice. It's has Bon Jovi come out with anything new lately. No. The newest of his old stuff. Most recent. <laughs> okay, the book is Conspiracy of Fools by Kurt Eichemald. Oh. It's, it's great. It, you will hate them so much. Really? Oh, I mean, they're awful people. <laughs> the last thing that I wanted to say, and then I'll, I'll let other people get back to the talking again, was um, you mentioned that you really like Twitter. Um, I, I'm a big fan of Twitter as well. And what I think that Twitter has done, uh, even though they just recently expanded to the 240 from the 120 or whatever, however many characters it was, is it's made me be a little more concise. Uh, I tend to ramble like I am now uh, when I write emails or when I talk or anything like that. And so trying to get a thought across on Twitter where I have a very finite amount of space that I can do, it's really helped me to do that when I have a quick, concise point, get across, next thing, as long as I don't thread. Try not to thread. Yeah, you know, it's been really interesting. I, I agree with that. I think Twitter has, it's forced people to be more clever with their words. And I actually read another book about the linguistics of the internet. And it's about how even just texting, emojis, Twitter, it has May, it has shifted our language in really interesting ways. And it's not that it's good or bad or we're getting dumber. It's just we're adapting and we're finding these other ways to be expressive. And now because of social media, we actually have more samples across all class, race, um, socioeconomic status than we've ever had before at our disposal that linguists can mine and try to understand what does a young man in this region at this moment in time how does that person express himself versus the truly learned? Um, and what does that even mean? You know, all our studies before were so elitist or haphazard in how we use language. So I think it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. I also think threading has become really interesting because there are certain times when like experts will do it to tease out an idea or um, I've done a lot of work with equity and diversity and inclusion in this profession. And I follow all these really different, interesting people from software developers to others and sometimes there are really powerful threads that you can follow where people will explain a particular idea and i find it really interesting not everyone should thread all the time but there's been some places where i've actually saved them because i think they get to a helpful conclusion mm -hmm. so the question then is do do we like the first post of the thread or do you like all posts in a thread Oh, I just uh, email link to the first post to myself so that I can save it in all the sort of myriad <laughs> folders that I have. Oh. So that, uh, because sometimes it'll be more about like, how do you manage or how do you lead or how do you hire? And some are more overtly about like, what should a parental leave policy be or something about climate change? Um, so they sort of go into different filters depending on in what context I want to remember them or who I want to share them with. How do you guys do this in the office? Is it you guys utilize Twitter? Or I know Carl uses Slack. 
Bill and I really love teams. You know, how do you create that culture of communication? Well, uh, our firm uses teams. Um, and, you know, obviously right now with everyone remote, we're relying on it even more. But as someone who works across the whole firm, and even though I sit in San Francisco, you know, I'm on video calls all the time anyway, collaborating with principals or a marketing director or somebody else in another office. Um, and then prior to this outbreak, you know, was then traveling to different offices a couple times each quarter, you know, kind of making the circuit so that we're maintaining that face to face. Um, what we're doing right now is each office has a like water cooler channel on teams. And that's like, mm. I know in San Francisco, we're doing trivia and scavenger hunts. And um, the firm, a lot of the offices do watercolor club. And so we're still doing it virtually. I want to be a part of the watercolor color club for sure. Yeah. Or just the coloring club. Yeah, or sketching or whatever it is. It's just like a nice social thing once a week, every other week that a lot of people were doing, you know, at lunch in their offices that we're just now doing a firm wide one. Mm. And what we're then doing is trying to share a lot of that or synthesize it on our intranet. Um, so like we were doing some, what's your Spotify playlist of the week? Um, plus all the like, Hey, here's where my project was, or, you know, we have a couple of projects that are really remote. So the crew was already kind of camping there. Um, so some of their work is still continuing on that construction. We're just obviously not visiting it. So, you know, we still have photos to share and we're even doing a lessons learned on workflows, teams that have been working on deadlines, like what's been working for them, what would they do better? How would they engage with their clients? So we're trying to still maintain as much of that as possible because th we still have a lot to share and learn. Absolutely. I think I'm going to do a post today on our inter intranet of what's working for you remotely. There you go. So do you use the real Twitter client on your, on your phone or do you use a third party one? I use the real Twitter app. Really? Yeah. I have switched over to TweetBot. And why? Because it's chronological. Mm. Where it doesn't like put posts that Twitter thinks is more important on the top. Mm. And the other thing it does, which is really cool and why I'm talking about it, is I have it on my phone and my tablet. Mm. It knows where I left off on the tablet and automatically puts the phone to the same spot interesting yes it's really really cool are these apple devices or no i have an apple device i wouldn't know about the android devices are both the tablet and the phone apple devices of course <laughs> why would you mix and match well if you have to go apple you have to go the whole way the port right phone, right because right. Yeah. once you go mac That's you never go back you. i don't know about that uh, I don't. I have a PC though, but I still have a iPad and a and a phone as an Apple device. But yeah, it goes right back to the other spot. Hmm. Yeah, pretty cool. Should try it out. Any any final thoughts? We're right at an Auburn, which is thirty minutes in in real people talk. Karen, how do you see communication evolving with? with this situation, like right, you, you kind of reference, like we're in the middle of it, right? We're, we are definitely mm -hmm. in the thick of it. And how do you see when maybe we're starting to see the, the light at the end of the tunnel through this whole <laughs> situation, how do you see communication evolving into a point where, when we are able to maybe come within a six foot boundary, um, <laughs> you know, how, how do you see that changing the way we communicate from, you know, yesteryear? Well, I th what I hope is that we'll take some of the things we learned while we're all remote and we have to make more of an effort to make sure we're being clear and precise and err on the side of over communication and specificity that we actually carry that with us when we are able to be face to face again. Because I think so often we rely on unsaid agreements or... Um, we make assumptions and it's harder to do that when it's digital because then you see these gaps where people are like, well, you didn't put it in the text. So how was I to know um, that hopefully we learn some good habits. Um, but I think I mean, the biggest thing is that we're going to want to be together again. Um, I think we're also finding these new ways or ways to more intentionally foster culture and community 
whether it's in our firms or with our families and friends. And I hope that we carry that forward because this is the time we kind of figure out, like, who do we really want to be with? You know, the Bolin Swinsky Jackson has a, a new monograph, and ironically, it's called Gathering. And it came out at the beginning of this year, and we worked really hard to develop a campaign around it called The Year of Gathering. And we had two events, and the idea was that each event was an opportunity to convene around ideas and to have a conversation that was relevant and interesting, where we bring together our collaborators, critics, other experts, and we invite them to the table and we have this dialogue. And, um, you know, even though we can't physically gather right now, we, those conversations are still important. They still allow us to explore ideas and to be designers and creative thinkers and to push ourselves. And so, you know, for, for me right now, we're, we're thinking about, well, how can we still do that in our current climate? Because we humans will want to come together again. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So we're going to have to figure all that stuff out. Yeah. To keep those conversations flowing. Yeah. And, you know, I think for me, what's the silver lining is that um, we are reflecting more on how we want to say things and when mm -hmm. we say them. I think, you know, there's been a rush of noise more than usual. Everyone you've ever worked with is sending you an email saying, we're all working from home. We're all taking the right precautions. Yeah. And at a certain point, that's that's just a lot of noise that people don't have time or patience yeah. for. And so I think the real question is, what do we want to say? How do we be relevant and helpful and move us forward, not just sort of get on the same refrain as everyone else? Because I think at this point, we're all assuming you're all at home unless you are an essential worker. Right. Okay. Karen? Yes. Thank you very much for being on Ben Thoughts. Thank you. It, uh I this uh, I learned a lot on this episode. Believe it or not, <laughs> that's good. I think it was a great conversation to have. It's sort of something to take us off of the rabbit track for a bit and bring us back down to earth to other things to do other than sitting behind your computer and running Revit all day. <laughs> See if you can get eight hundred books read or a hundred books read in a year and and try to beat her eight hundred book. <laughs> right now, which is going to be tough because by the time you get to 800 books, you'll probably you'll probably be at 1500 books yeah. or 1600 books. And if it's me, when you get to 800, when I get to 800 books, you'll probably be at 10,000 books because I read as slow as Carl. <laughs> I don't books. know. I don't know. I'm a very quick reader. But I will say it's been very satisfying to keep track, even just a list of what I've read. Um, uh huh. Because it. It's a reminder, and I even if I don't always remember every title, mm -hmm. um, when I look back at that list, like I'm reminded of what I was doing in my life when I read it because I mm -hmm. remember that flight or, right, you know, whatever it triggered for me in my life at that moment. Um, so it's it's a nice record, and it's because I do read so much. It's really fun to be able to go back, and as I meet new people, and they're like, "Oh, what should I read?" Um, I have this whole repository to be like, hmm, you're a crime fiction person? Okay, you should read this. Um, it's just a really nice library. I have a really hard time organizing my book library. Like, do you just keep it all together? Do you, you know, alphabetical, do you keep it into different genres? What if there's fusion genres? Like, you know, how do you decide? Well, no, we our books are not organized. We... Um, we have many, and we moved from Boston to San Francisco over the summer, so that was a lot of boxes. Oh, that's a, that's a big change. Yeah. See, I thought with your demeanor that you were probably a San Francisco girl. And, you know, these two always give me a hard time for being an East Coast girl. No, born and raised outside of Boston. Oh, how um, about that? Yeah. Um, but, you know, the books are not organized in any particular way. All I really do is just keep a list on my phone. Um, by year of what I've read, and oh, I make a note cool. if it was an audiobook. Um, and I actually I keep them on a WordPress site, so anyone could look at them if they really wanted to. And each year is a different page. And that's actually linked to your Twitter. It's on my Twitter page, yeah. So how do how do we find those things? Well, my Twitter handle is Karen Elaine R. So um, you can follow me there. That's uh -huh. also my Instagram handle. Those uh, chats that you had. 
um, are recorded and on the website, the knowledgearchitecture.com. Oh yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. All, all those talks are really good. Mine's the best. Yours is, yours is (laughs) the second best. And I'll say that to all the people we have on. Uh huh. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah. I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me there. You can find me Uh on Twitter. There you go. I love Google Sheets. I love all Google products in general. You are the Google later. So I you and Carl, you're both Google, Googlers. Which is why I just can't be an Apple person. They, they, they I, don't know. <laughs> I love uh, Google. So Karen, Apple or Google? Oh uh, yeah, all my stuff is Apple. Yeah. I'm sorry, Karen. No, it's fine. I mean, I, I don't <laughs> I mean, really care because. It's just so proprietary. <laughs> I really hate that. I want to be able to plug my phone in like an external hard drive and pull stuff off of it. You know, what if you uh, want to be able to throw a book on there? You have to put it on Apple Tunes or whatever it's called. No, no you use Kindle. the Kindle app. Yeah, Kindle. You Kindle. know what I can do? I can plug my USB into my laptop and drag and drop it like it's a USB. Okay, yeah. but do you use the Libby app? No. Libby is the public library app, so if you have a library card. What is that called? Libby, L-I-B-B-Y. Yeah. L-I-B-B-Y. Hit and the search if, button. If you, if you have a library card to your public library, um, you usually have, a oh, have to go get a card. access to their electronic mm-hmm. library. And uh-huh. um, you, I, so I'm logged in. Um, under my San Francisco public library card and anything I want to request that they have audio Kindle, just like native in the app to read. Um, I can request, I think I could request something like 20 books or like things from the library. Um, Hmm. and that's actually how sometimes I keep my reading list. Well, well, that's how you could (laughs) afford to read 800 books. Yeah, so 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 much of it is just like you hear about something. I go, I request it on Libby, and then you know, yeah. some some of them it's like six months later, and I'll be like, "What was this about? Um, <laughs> Why did I get this book?" But what's great is it has a record of what you checked out. So if you didn't get oh, to it, yeah. you can like add it back to your holds or like you know choose it another time. Um, oh, okay. So when you when a book comes in and it's a Kindle book, you just click read on Kindle, and then it downloads right to the Kindle app on your phone or iPad or whatever. That would be a good conversation, Bill, is where do you get your media? Where do I get my media? I, I'm YouTube it these days. Oh, yeah. YouTube is fantastic. I love it on my Fire Stick. I love everything on YouTube. I even started, a, even started my YouTube channel, Read the Factory Manual. Now we can officially end the episode. You got your plug in, Bill. <laughs> That's right. There you go. All right, Karen, thank you very much. We'll let you get back to your day. Thank you. And uh, we, I hope everyone is back at the office real soon to see all their friends. Yeah, me too. Hope we can gather again soon. <laughs>